Good evening to you all. I bring you greetings and best wishes from our Vice Chancellor, Professor Sumogila Mutwa. She's unfortunately out of town traveling uh, on university business, and she asked me to host this inaugural lecture on behalf of the university. I'm Andrew Leach, I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Engagement, and I greet, first of all, my fellow DVCs, Professor Denise Sin and Mr. Lebohang Hachatze. I also greet the deans, deputy deans, sitting in the front row in the different colors of the respective faculties. I greet also our academic staff, especially from the Faculty of Health Sciences, and then members of the public. And maybe I could see by way of a show of hands, I know that some of you, many of you perhaps, are here from outside the university, but to show support for our professor. Can I see? We welcome you especially. Thank you so much for being here. This is, in fact, a public event. It's a showcase in the life of any university, and certainly ours, and we have it in our diary for months. The inaugural lecture of a scholar, an academic, who has been promoted or pointed to the rank of full professor at the university. And of course, this evening, it is indeed a great pleasure for us to invite Professor Ngobo Sitole to present her inaugural lecture in a few moments. I do recall us being in the, the committee, the selection committee, the appointments committee, some time back when we were considering from across the country those who had responded to the advert, and I'm indeed delighted, as is the university and the faculty, that Professor Yu accepted the offer and that you are one of us now. I've also read through the abstract of your inaugural lecture for this evening, and I'm fascinated by the scholarly expertise that you have brought to our university, and we surely will learn from you as we receive your lecture this evening, but also as a professor within the Faculty of Health Sciences, as you profess your discipline and you take a leading role in the faculty in your respective discipline and department in support of the great vision that we have for health sciences at our university. As I said, an inaugural lecture is a very, very important milestone in the career of any academic, and this evening is no exception at all. So we look forward to your lecture, Professor, and we wish you all the very best. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite our Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Lungila Pepeta, to come to the podium to formally introduce our professor, uh, we're reading through her CV. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DVC. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Magnolia Basle Ngobositole. She matriculated from Mutabelo High School in 1983. She then trained as a registered nurse and a midwife at Edendale College of Nursing in Peter Maritzburg. She started working at Prince Mishien Memorial Hospital in theater in 1988 and left after four years to pursue her studies in psychology at the University of Cape Town. After completing her undergraduate and honors degree, she received her master's in clinical psychology from the University of Port Elizabeth, now Nelson Mandela University as we know it, in 1998. After the internship, she secured a joint post as a clinical psychologist for the Department of Health in KwaZulu-Natal and a lecturer at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in the Department of Behavior Medicine. She worked for the Etewini region and rotated between King Edward VIII Hospital, King George V Hospital, 
R.K. Khan Hospital and Prince Mishien Memorial Hospital. She was also actively involved in the partnership between the Department of Health and AMSC services by providing psychological services to the hospitals in the rural areas. When the Department of Behavior Medicine made the decision to decentralize psychology services, she established the psychology department in Prince Mishien Memorial Hospital. While working as the head of the psychology department, she pursued her studies for the PhD degree. She worked in KwaZulu-Natal for 13 years. In 2012, she obtained her PhD degree in behavior medicine through the UKZN. She subsequently joined the Department of Health in the Western Cape, working as a clinical psychologist for Steckland Psychiatric Hospital and a lecturer at Stellenbosch University in the Department of Psychiatry. She contributed to the teaching of psychology in the medical program and in the psychiatry postgraduate diploma. As a clinician, she contributed to the education and training of clinical psychologists for 21 years. She has served as a clinical supervisor for 18 years, successfully producing a substantial number of young psychologists. She was instrumental in the establishment of the Forum of African Psychology that is now a recognized subdivision of PSYSSA. Her nomination and current involvement in the Health Professions Council of South Africa Professional Board for Psychology cemented her experience in the discipline of psychology. She serves on the Committee of Preliminary Inquiry on the Education Training and Registration Committee and on the Examination Subcommittees of the HPCSA Board for Psychology where she informs policy development related to the psychology profession. In 2018, she joined Nelson Mandela University where she now facilitates learning at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels, refining and developing new programs and modules. She contributes to the knowledge creation through the mentoring and supervision of honors, masters, and PhD students' research projects. She has an emerging reputation both nationally and internationally, evidenced by invitations to serve as editor, external examiner, and has acted as a reviewer to international journals. Currently, she plays a leadership role in the Department of Psychology as the head of department and contributes to faculty and university committees. I request Professor Magnolia Ngobositore to come to the lectern and deliver her lecture. I'm going to start with water. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Vice Chancellor, Executive Deans, members of senior leadership, members of Senate, distinguished guests, colleagues, fellow students, friends and family. It is an honor to give this inaugural lecture today. I have been given 45 minutes to address you this evening. Therefore, I will use this time profitably and make sure that you are not bored and sleepy by the time I end. <laughs> when I was young, I did not necessarily have visions of myself standing here in front of you like this, and especially moving out of my village, which is far, far, far away in the Bundus of rural UKZN, and reaching this far in my academic and professional development. It is true that education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it. 
and you must prepare for it today. That's Malcolm X. I want to say a special welcome to my family, all the way from KwaZulu Natal, who managed to travel to Port Elizabeth and be with us this evening. I also welcome my cousins from the Eastern Cape and from Cape Town. I want to begin by thanking God Almighty for looking after me and helping me to be who I am today and placing me where I am right now. There is no professor in my community and it is indeed by his grace that the community of Oswatini has a professor. I consider it a great privilege to be the first woman professor in my privilege. I thus honor all the amazing women in my life because behind every successful woman is a tribe of other successful women who have her back. Thank you, Mom, for getting me out of that community for my high school education. Thank you for being brave enough to defy the prevailing norms of no education for girls. Thank you for carrying me a lot longer than nine months, especially when I resigned from my first job and decided to pursue my studies, just when you thought that you have done your job as a mother and you were hoping that I would contribute to the upbringing of my siblings. I know I did that twice <laughs> um, in my working life, but you were there for me and supported my decisions even though what I did had financial implications for you. I would like to say a special thank you to my sister, Ntobego, for standing by mom when I was not there. Thank you to my girls, Ayanda, Akona, Tando, <laughs> for being the most amazing people in my life. I also want to thank Oleta, Sisanda, Bongani, Dodo, Sifezile, Tomsomi. Thank you for being here with me today. Sis Joyce, thank you for being here with me today. Nelly, thank you for being here with me today. While I have given presentations internationally and locally, this is the first time that I'm giving a presentation in front of my family. So, <laughs> when I told my family and friends that I have an inaugural lecture, some of them asked, what does that involve? And I pondered on a lot of possible answers which were a bit complicated. So I just ended up saying it's my graduation. <laughs> so dear academics, after this, when you interact with my family, don't confuse them. It's my graduation. I'd like to, to thank all the lecturers, my colleagues, who continue to support me and who continue to contribute to the person that I am. Thank you for your constant support and your mentorship. I would like to thank the following people in absentia. Sure. My father, my late, um, the late Christopher, whose spirit will always be with us. I owe much of my academic and professional development also to Professor Basil Pillay. He is the head of the Department of Behavioral Medicine at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. I worked under his supervision while completing my PhD. And he, con he inducted me into the world of research and into presentations and also into internet, international, <laughs> into the international spheres. So I made my first national presentation at the CISA conference in Jobek through his mentorship. 
I express my gratitude towards Melanie Hendricks, my previous boss, who appreciated my professional contribution when I was working with her and made it possible for me to be on the professional board for psychology. I honor the women and children who shared their stories with me throughout my professional and research journey. I want to thank each and every one of you who are here this evening for taking the time to join me. And finally, I would like to thank all the organizers who made this day splendid. Considering that I'm talking about gender-based violence, I'm going to start off with this quote. He doesn't have to hit you for it to be abuse. He can manipulate, belittle, humiliate, curse, blame, scream, ridicule, disrespect, and try to control you. Abuse gets worse over time. Get help now. With that quote as the introduction, throughout the years of working as a psychologist, I have been helping African people understand the basis of their psychological distress from a Western perspective. Not only have I overlooked the importance of their cultural heritage in the treatment, but I also ignored its importance as a precipitating factor behind psychological distress. Consequently, most of them defaulted prematurely from therapy. So in this lecture, I draw your attention to the complexity of the African traditional belief system as a driver for gender-based violence, which is at the forefront of most countries in the world. Gender-based violence is also one of the problematic areas within the South African continent. Our understanding of gender-based violence is one-sided. We always tend to look at it from a Western perspective. One thing that must be clear is that gender-based violence is a very broad subject. Therefore, all perspectives need to be considered. The World Health Organization observed that gender-based violence refers to any harm which may be physical, psychological, or sexual that is perpetrated against any person based on their gender, or which is a socially ascribed attribution, and differences between men and women without their will. In the South African continent, we seem to have assimilated the same description or the same understanding of GPV. We see gender-based violence as a type of violence that is perpetrated against one who is less powerful. The power differential between men and women is largely determined by the different gender roles that are prescribed by society. We socialize boys and girls differently. When a male child is born, African families rejoice because he is expected to carry the family name forward. But when a girl is born, there is a sense of disappointment in the family because she will get married and leave the family, and this cuts off the genealogy. We teach boys to be strong and independent, yet girls are taught to be weak and dependent. This is why when we speak about gender-based violence, we automatically assume that we are referring to women as victims and men as perpetrators. Their roles can be reversed. Gender-based violence has an impact on the individuals, the family, and the community. The physical impact includes the bruising, the broken bones, chronic pain, death. Femicide rates have increased lately. The psychological impact includes depression, anxiety, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, and severe psychopathology. Understanding gender-based violence from an African perspective has not been eloquently explored, yet the complexity pushes us to understand it from all perspectives, as I have mentioned. So my address this evening will point this out. I have put up two photographs. That's my community, where I come from. Ozotini is that red, tiny blob on the map. I am originally from rural KwaZulu-Natal, an area known as Ozotini. Consequently, some of the topics that I will highlight this evening are drawn from my observations growing up in this community, and some of them are from professional encounters. Ozotini is a small area. I am sure that most of you don't even know this area. 1% of the population in this area is conversant in other languages, and 99% is Zulu speaking. The literature generally presents rural life from a deficit perspective, emphasizing the limited resources, limited school and limited social life. There is one hospital in the area. Schools are very much under-resourced. They can testify. We do not have access to basic resources like clean running water. The only source of water that we have is from rainwater that is collected through the tanks, the drums, and plastic containers. When it's laundry day, sometimes we collect the water from the nearby coastal college. So we're stealing the water. The area is quite isolated from the rest of South Africa. But what is pertinent about this area for today's topic is that the community is deeply traditional and highly gendered. It has been my observation growing up in this area that customary law takes precedence over the constitution of South Africa. Even though, if you look at chapter one of the constitution, it declares that it, it is supreme over every other law. I have witnessed that customary practices that undermine gender equality are still preserved in my community. Boys and girls are socialized that a woman's role is to serve the man, and a man's role is to be the head of the family. Girls are groomed into marriage and childbearing from a young age. No one questions the power and privilege assigned to men in this community. It is as if these issues do not exist, nor do they bother anyone. Most of the girls that I attended primary school with are married, and they were married at a young age, and they never made it through to matric. Early marriage exacerbates gender inequality. Besides, there is a link between lack of education and low socioeconomic status, which means that these women's socioeconomic status remains low for the rest of their life. When I look at the drivers of gender-based violence in my community, the first one is known as Ugutwala in Dombi. In English, it's made an abduction. For those not familiar with the custom, it involves the kidnapping of a girl by a potential husband with his friends and family. Then the following day, a messenger is sent to the girl's parents with a request from the boy's family for marriage negotiations. When I was young, our helper, who was my nanny at the time, was abducted. And she stayed married in that family that abducted her till today. 
This happened one day we left for school and then when we got back, she had vanished. There were no cell phones those days. So we heard from someone who had seen what had happened. So while all this is happening in our local community, the constitution identifies the right to equality, including the right to gender equality as one of its essential pillars. The question on my mind is, how can things change for women in traditional communities when traditional leaders make decisions that have an impact on the community? And the traditional healers also argue that the decisions that they are making are actually supported by this constitution. What they say is true. When you look at the constitution, it advocates for and supports the right to culture very clearly in chapter 2, section 15.3. Furthermore, the constitution recognizes the functions of traditional leaderships and assigns them more power on local community matters. The next point is Ogutlola Intombi, virginity testing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very contentious issue in South Africa. Virginity testing is a custom conducted by elderly women on girls. They check a girl's vagina for signs of sexual activity. Virginity testing takes place in a variety of settings. For example, it takes place in the privacy of a family home, the crawl of a village, at the chief's place, in schools, in community centers, and sometimes in stadiums. Most of the virginity testing events are only known by the community nearby. One of the most publicized one is the one that takes place in Northern Natal, in Guanangoma, we must have seen this on TV, In some instances, girls that are still virgins receive a certificate after the testing. Some of them get a paint somewhere on their face. And some of them get a grading. You get a grade A or a grade B or a grade C. And most of the girls are actually in support of this practice. One of the girls in Mbulu's study says, I now have 10 certificates, and for me, that's not enough. I want to have at least 15 certificates. I look at them on the wall at home with much pride and joy. Considering that girls take pride in their certificates, when I was working at Prince Mshieni, I noticed that there was an increased number of suicide attempts amongst girls during the period of virginity testing. The reason being that they were anxious about their virginity status. They feared it would be discovered that they were actually now sexually active and they would not get any certificate. There are two schools of thought that have originated regarding virginity testing. The first school of thought argues for virginity testing, <laughs> suggesting that it is a custom that protects girls from premarital sex, keeps them pure, prevents the spread of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases. In chapter two of the Children's Act, under social, cultural, and religious practices, Virginity testing is covered and is supported by the Act. Furthermore, the Act stipulates conditions that must be observed when the practice is being done. So initially they say that virginity testing of children under the age of 16 is prohibited by law. And then they say that virginity testing of children older than 16 may be performed and then they give you conditions. If the child 
has given consent to the testing and then after proper counseling and then in a manner that has been prescribed. The results of a virginity test may not be disclosed without the consent of the child. The body of the child who has undergone virginity testing may not be marked, so the painting goes away. The second school of thought argues that virginity testing is dehumanizing and is an infringement of individual human rights. Similarly, this school of thought throws its ideas from the law. The Constitution of South Africa, in section 10, it refers to the right to dignity and says, everyone has an inherent right to dignity and the right to have their dignity respected and protected. Section 12 argues, everyone has the right to bodily and psychological integrity, which includes the right not to be subjected to medical or scientific experiments without their informed consent. Over the years, many contrasting policies and legal frameworks have been passed, and these touch on the lives of individuals in the rural areas significantly. It seems that it's up to each person which school of thought you select when it comes to virginity testing. It's unfortunate that while our constitution proclaims everyone to be equal, women are still subjected to a position of a second-class citizen and in very many cases to being an object which can just be made to lie on the floor and be subjected to an informal gynecological exam under the umbrella of culture. I'm not saying that I hate my culture, love my culture. To a child growing up in my community, what we identify as gender-based violence seems like a perfectly normal way of life. The downplaying, the misnaming of violence against women as culturally appropriate is concerning in that setting. Researchers have conducted studies and they found that women tend to see their abuse as normal. And this unfortunately perpetuates a culture of violence in South Africa. Whatever school of thought you may select, my take on the matter is that you should keep in mind that there are developments going on around the country. We are in the 21st century now. There are probably better ways of controlling for HIV. There are also better ways of controlling for unwanted pregnancies. The next driver of gender-based violence that I'm going to talk about today is polygamy. Is it him? The eradication of patriarchy does not seem to have happened in most traditional communities. They, <clears throat> they continue to be patriarchal. While the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act acknowledges the equality of women when it comes to property, it still supports multiple customary marriages in Section 2 and Section 7. Not all is bad, though, about polygamy. For example, studies have found that polygamy is beneficial to black African women because the practice provides them with emotional support, friendship, and sisterhood. Furthermore, marriage is identified as a fundamental right of passage, and every girl wants to be married someday, so why not get the one that already has another woman? <laughs> Finally, it is a method of taking care of the widows. We also have a custom known as Ugungena, so, when an older brother dies and his wife is passed on to 
the brother that is still alive. So that takes care of the woman. So policies against polygamy again are in contradiction. For instance, the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination in chapter two, section eight, prohibits any practice, including traditional, customary, or religious practice which impairs the dignity of women and undermines equality between women and men, including the undermining of the dignity and well-being of the girl child. So which law do you take into consideration? Another practice that is viewed by women with great ambivalence is the payment of ilobolo, bridal wealth. For any customary marriage to be considered valid, Ilobolo must be paid. Section three of the Recognition of Customary Marriages Act provides that a customary marriage must be discussed and celebrated in terms of customary law. And within customary law, Ilobolo is a requirement. Ilobolo is described in the recognition as property in cash or kind, which a prospective husband or head of his family undertakes to give to the head of a prospective wife's family in consideration of a customary marriage. Previously, Ilobolo could involve the exchange of cattle or other animals or any other property as agreed to by the parties. Currently, cash is preferred and it's extremely, extremely expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so currently cash is preferred, even though different ethnic groups have different practices pertaining to the amount and how this amount is paid. Some pay just a quarter and they argue that so, which means that you do not pay in full for the wife. But some pay the full amount. So, while some academics have argued that it is a demeaning practice and a tool to promote women subordination, it is still very much enforced and we love it. <coughs> In many occasions, the payment of ilobolo has been linked to gender-based violence. For instance, in some studies, they have found that half of the participants in their study attributed their experience of abuse to the ilobolo custom. Payment for the woman in terms of ilobolo serves as a guarantee for sex. That's what men say which, if not readily forthcoming, could be taken by force. Many black women in South Africa believe that the payment of filobolo means that their husband owns them. She has to have sex whether she likes it or not. It is indeed unfortunate that traditional societies are not only beaten or kicked around or killed but also must be available for sex, even if they don't want to. Marriage, we call it umendo. Marriage is seen as an important institution in African societies. While marriage is often a union between two individuals in many African societies, it is primarily a union between two families and communities. Traditionally, marriage is initiated by the groom's family, sometimes with the knowledge of both the parties to be married, and at other times without the knowledge of the woman, for example, if someone was like kidnapped in the first scenario. According to traditional Zulu culture, a woman should leave the father's house 
marry and remain in the marriage irrespective of the problems that she encounters in the marriage. A wife may only live in a coffin if at all she leaves the marriage. And in the end, her grave is expected to be next to her husband. If the husband dies, the widow is expected to remain with his family until her death. Despite worldwide campaigns for the promotion of basic human rights, African beliefs and traditional practices remain inflexible. In a study on youth relationships here in the Eastern Cape, violence was seen as an indication of the depth of feelings and intense male jealousy, which is often characterized by violence, was seen as an explicit sign of love. In this context, girls also distinguish between forced sex and rape, where rape was perceived as an act that is violently enacted by a stranger. On the other hand, forced sex was seen as stemming from overwhelming affection or it was identified also as marking the commencement of a strong relationship. Opposing findings are also reported in studies conducted in America where it was found that jealousy had a potential to lead to emotional and sexual abuse. But we don't see that in South Africa. We just want him to beat me, to show that he loves me. So what does this mean for us South Africans? As parents, how do we socialize our kids? Have we become so indoctrinated by our culture that we choose not to question the practice of certain customs even though they expose women and children to gender-based violence? Well, like all other mothers, I still want my daughter to get married, but hopefully that must happen the right way without exposing her to humiliation. There is a link between gender-based violence and witchcraft, which I've identified as one driver for gender-based violence. A study in Limpombo revealed that most of the women reported gender-based violence experiences that are linked to witchcraft. Men accuse women of witchcraft as a way of controlling them. One study draws from a woman's experience who reported how she was forced to cook naked by her husband on suspicion of witchcraft. She reported that he would call the children to come and watch a naked witch cooking in the kitchen. At times he would refuse to eat the food, saying that he cannot eat food that has been cooked by a witch. I was hurt. I became isolated and felt humiliated. I knew I had to leave my husband as I did not know what else was going to happen to me. My own kids started treating me badly. While I was a nurse, I have seen a child whose genitals were cut off from her. I can vividly see the jacket laceration on her pubic area. This is one image that I can never get out of my, that thing. And then I learned later, this was a cut that she sustained because her genitals were removed to make a concoction, umuti, for someone to be rich. The explanation for the traditional healer was that when there is a need for body parts to make umoti, the witch doctors generally give an instruction that the body part that they need must be cut off from a live warm body. If the body part is taken from a corpse, then the muti will not be as effective or as strong as it's supposed to be. And it won't do what you're supposed to what it's supposed to do. Fontaine argues that some acts are evil and as such are inexplicable. 
in human terms. These acts are described above are certainly evil. The sexual and physical abuse of children, particularly very young children, serves to exemplify a major form of evil and to characterize those who commit these acts as inhuman monsters. Most of the South African community, communities in the rural areas are just pure ignorant. Witchcraft and traditional customs are not the only gender-based violence drivers that women and children are exposed to. You will remember a time when there were misperceptions and ignorance around how HIV can be treated and people believe that if you sleep with a virgin, then you are automatically cured. A case of baby Tsepang is one example. I'm sure that those who are old enough will remember Tsepang. That was a case that was around 2001. For those who are not familiar with the story, Tsepang was a nine-month-old baby from Uppington who was raped by five men. These were HIV-infected men, and they believed that if they have sex with a child, then HIV will sort of disappear. This incident happened at a time when there was this misperception that sex with an innocent virgin miraculously cures HIV. The humiliation and suffering that the women and children are exposed to in this country is unthinkable. Earlier in the year, President Ramaphosa in his sauna addressed us, the country, and said we must hang our heads in shame at the state of gender-based violence and the patriarchal practices that give rise to it in the country. Intlonipo and respect is another custom. While gender-based violence incites more public upheaval on a social level, on a personal level, its tolerance remains surprisingly high amongst black women. <coughs> it has been noted in one study that about 2,200% of women view the Kosa culture as key to male domination, which was rooted in socialization since young girls are told to respect and obey their husbands. In another African country like Kenya, women are expected to be submissive, follow the rules set by their husband, show obedience and respect. So women cope by enduring the suffering. In a study conducted by Kachwa, a married woman's respect and obedience towards her husband was explored. One woman indicated that she accepted her husband as the head of the family and insisted his word had to be made law in his home. Another woman in the same study reported that it was taboo for a woman to challenge her husband's power, and therefore a woman had to be submissive and obedient to the husband. The concept of Inklonipo has a lot to do with perseverance. Inklonipo consists of both positive and negative aspects. The positive aspects consist of shyness, avoidance of behaviors that might reflect badly on the family. And on the opposite end are aspects that include being docile, self-sacrificing, and unquestioning towards male dominance. Meaning that women stay in abusive relationships in order to protect the family name and the family's reputation while sacrificing themselves. 
due to a lack of African theoretical orientations that adequately account for customs like these, it has been believed that this is learned helplessness. I maintain that Inlonipo provides a much more plausible explanation for why African women stay in abusive relationships than the literature on learned helplessness. There might be some similarities though, in that the theory of learned helplessness assumes that women exposed to uncontrollable emotional abuse become significantly debilitated to the point of not knowing what to do except to persevere. African women, on the other hand, do not, say in, do not stay in abusive relationships because they are not motivated enough to get out, nor do they persevere because they do not know what to do. But it is because they believe that it would be disrespectful to the whole family and they would humiliate the whole family if they left. So in summary, we are all affected by gender-based violence, either directly as recipients or indirectly as observers. Violence against women comes from a variety of angles. It threatens their dignity, health, security, and the well-being of children. For a long time, violence against women and children has remained a problematic issue. In my line of work, clients have reported being subjected to what ranges from minor violent acts to severe acts of violence. Throughout the years, I have witnessed the pain, the anguish suffered by women and children because of psychological physical, sexual, and economic abuse. Sometimes I have sat helplessly, not knowing what to say or what to do or how to respond to them, and they have watched them cry. I have consoled, supported, empathized, and tried to help them as much as I could. There are also instances where I just sat and put on my therapist mask, because as a therapist, you're not supposed to be moved by what the client brings to you. When we look at expressions of psychological distress, Most studies have, conduct, have been conducted to show that African women do not speak in terms of emotional expression. They show their distress through headaches. I have a headache today, or I can't walk today. I had a client who was sent to every neurosurgeon because she just couldn't walk, only to find that her husband had taken all her certificates and she wasn't able to get a job. So obviously, psychologically, she felt that she couldn't just do anything and ended up, ended up sub subjecting herself to all the cuts. So what I have learned is that while gender-based violence is linked to depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and cognitive deficits, the manifestation of symptoms differs from person to person and from culture to culture. This was verified by Gordon, who discovered that patients experiencing intimate partner violence commonly present with seemingly unrelated problems or with multiple soft, non-specific somatic or emotional complaints. In any culture, there are certain ways in which psychological distress is understood. Scholars have consistently suggested that somatization is a central form of expressing psychic distress amongst black women. 
because the body and soul are interlinked in African explanatory models of illness, somatic complaints are often reported by depressed African women. Increased health risk behavior is also another symptom. It has become common in African women exposed to gender-based violence to use alcohol excessively, drugs, smoking, <coughs> and other health risk behaviors. Researchers have examined the relationship between gender-based violence, alcohol use, and sexual risk behavior amongst women and reported that women who consumed more alcohol are more likely to report being recently abused by a partner. Women victimized emotionally also present with an increased rate of self-inflicted injuries, poor child care, which is evidenced by a high rate of mortality in children under the age of five, and poor help-seeking behavior. Secrecy and silence are cherished among African families. That is why studies on gender-based violence have found generally low rates of, of help-seeking behaviors. One study found that 85% of participants in her study admitted to being socialized into secrecy about their experiences of abuse. Another study also suggests that battery forms part of family secrets and is not to be reported unless it is critical. So how do we assess what's critical and what's not critical? These deep-seated cultural beliefs and social sanctions play a powerful role in discouraging women from seeking help. Furthermore, abusers often intimidate women into not reporting the abuse and threaten to take away their financial support because many black women remain profoundly economically disempowered. Hyper-religiosity is also a very common in women that are exposed to gender-based violence. No God-fearing woman of the Christian faith would want to go against the will of God. Therefore, the church elders often fall back on the Bible verses to justify patriarchal ideologies that oppress women. One researcher argues that the continued use of biblical texts has an impact on women's dignity. Mistreatment and oppression of women can indeed be ascribed to a certain degree of misinterpretations of the biblical text. A history of racism, misdiagnosis, and a lack of culturally sensitive services has caused this population of women to seek comfort from black churches, rather than to consider professional mental health services. And if you have attended one of these churches, you will understand why they go there. I've been there, it's very cathartic. Women choose to go to black churches because not only of the services that are free or that they get to eye the gorgeous service providers, but also because it is a cultural comfort zone. They just express themselves anyway, anyhow. Therapeutic rapport develops quicker and results in opportunities for immediate assistance. The church service consists of confessions of sin, fellowship, and the outward expression of prayer, praising, and singing. So the external manifestation of emotions is often experienced as a therapeutic release that restores faith and hope. I have conducted some research involving black women and children. 
So why I chose black women and children? I do acknowledge that gender-based violence occurs in all racial groups. It is non-selective and it occurs in all genders. But I believe that there is a significant differences between the groups. These differences might be influenced by socio-cultural aspects and political issues. I find what Copano Ratele calls the singularity of the post-apartheid condition very relevant in the selection of my research participants. Along the same line as Copano, I argue that the singularity of our situation as black South African women cannot be confused with any other woman in the world. Our experiences with apartheid and cultural endowment cannot be comparable to anyone else. Black South African women struggle with an intersection of multiple expressive issues such as race, class, and gender inequality. The demographic and health survey conducted in 2016 revealed that one in five women older than 18 years has experienced gender-based violence in South Africa. Even though statistics are not reliable, possibly due to non-reporting and also due to some methodological factors and even due to how gender-based violence is understood in the country. So within the umbrella of gender-based violence, I conducted research on sexual abuse and its impact for my PhD studies. So of the research that I've conducted resulted in that one chapter that was put in that book of women and depression. As part of that study, I was particularly interested in the literature on sexual offending in men in rural areas as well. So I looked at the literature review, specifically touching on the offenders in rural areas. One of the studies conducted, is, uh, conducted in the rural villages had a sample of about 1,370 participants who admitted to sexual offending. Offending behavior has been a subject of interest for years with the researchers attempting to find explanations for dysfunctional sexual behavior. Some of the explanations include factors related to adverse developmental experiences, such as exposure to abuse, rejection, and attachment problems. Other explanations include psychological predispositions, such as cognitive deficits, empathy deficits, uh, empathy deficits, deviant sexual preferences, interpersonal problems, genetic predispositions, and contextual factors are also identified. Some other studies identified group-influenced offenders, naming them as the peer pressure pushers, or rather, the ones that are pushed by peer pressure to offend, to rape someone. There is also the naive experimenter, the one that is sexually curious and just needs to explore. And then there is a pseudo-socialized offender that appears confident and boastful and uses bribes. Then there is the under-socialized offender, the one that lacks interpersonal skills and uses sexual offending to gain power. And then there is the sexually aggressive that have poor impulse control and the sexually compulsive that use offending to alleviate fear and anxiety. And then there is the disturbed, disturbed impulsive, the one that, con that have conduct disorders and other aggressive tendencies. What is portrayed here is that sexual offenders consist of a diverse population, ranging from the naive experimenters on the one end to sadistic, 
to sadistic rapists on the other, and they all contribute to the high rates of sexual abuse in the country. And most of them, ladies and gentlemen, were identified in the rural areas. So in terms of the lessons that I learned from research, research and therapeutic work with populations exposed to gender-based violence has never been dispassionate. Moreover, a focus on sexual abuse continues to be challenging and controversial. The research participants are identified as vulnerable groups, and obtaining ethics approval is a mission. When I conducted my study, I went through three ethics committees. Because I was based in the Department of Behavioral Medicine, they obviously either were not sure when it was a right to say this is something that can be conducted. So it was sent to the social sciences faculty. Again, that was scrutinized by the committee from the social sciences. So you get to go through many loopholes. Thus, there must be consensus, consensus on how research protocols are screened. Secondly, each story moves you from a state of normalcy to heightened arousal, and then to a gradual return to equilibrium. So most psychologically well-adjusted individuals don't cope well with research in gender-based violence. Repeated exposure to traumatic stories has a cumulative effect. This is an area of inquiry that has a potential for secondary traumatization. Therefore, we need to know ourselves enough to detect the symptoms, the effects, and seek early interventions. So where to from here? My take here is, if you are not well prepared to be wrong, you will never come up with anything original. So go ahead, fight with those people until you manage to get your ethics approval, until you manage to conduct your studies in an ethical way, though. It is clear that gender-based violence has drivers originating from traditional African beliefs and practices. It is also evident that there are ways of expressing symptoms of distress that are culturally informed. So I plan on continuing to sensitize academics about these culturally informed ways of life. Despite legal and policy frameworks having been put into place, there exists opposing views that continue to complicate matters. So we need to look at those as well. Let us teach students about interventions that take cognizance of the dynamic nature of cultural beliefs and practices. We must select adherence to cultural practices that are not discriminating against women. In any country that recognizes the importance of traditional customs, men and women must have reciprocal rights and responsibilities. No custom must allow women to be submissive to men. One example of a therapeutic intervention that I will continue to advocate for is the use of expressive therapies, which I found was pretty much suitable for the traumatized African women. Through singing, dancing, Africans have expressed their emotions Expressive therapies acknowledge this difference in, therapeutic, in therapy. Practitioners of expressive therapies use tactile, music, visual, and other forms of medium in therapy. 
When these are included in therapy sessions, there is a great potential to increase the client's participation. So when I was in Cape Town, I pushed for expressive therapies and we ended up buying drums. We used drums in the institution. And therefore, as my farewell, the theme was drumming. So these activities permit individuals of all ages to express their feelings and thoughts in a manner that is different from the traditional talk therapies. And through expressive therapies, clients get to express their feelings in a way that talks, talk therapy can never achieve. In conclusion, gender-based violence is linked to traditional customs, and it is concerning that we don't know how to separate the two properly. There is no doubt that South Africa is in a crisis because of the high gender-based violence rates. While more women experience gender-based violence, some scholars have found that men are just as fearful of abuse. Studies show that a significant number of men are abused by their partners. But these men do not report these incidences. So the whole stereotype of boys don't cry prevents them from speaking out and seeking help. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to my talk today. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ntrobe Trobo uh, Sitoli, for that really powerful and I think very moving inaugural lecture. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Malweni Huyanan Almal. On behalf of the Nelson Mandela University, your colleagues in the faculty and department, academics and support, support staff, as well as students assembled here, I would like to extend our congratulations to Professor Magnolia Ngobo Sitole on the occasion of her inaugural lecture here tonight. Please, let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> this is a very special occasion, and you told us about how special it is, the first professor in your village, the first woman professor in your village. And we know that much preparation and anxiety goes into preparing an inaugural lecture. It's more than a graduation, uh, friends and family. Uh, it, it's being judged, uh, not just being kept, but being judged for uh, and acknowledged for the contribution that you make to knowledge production uh, in society and in the world. To become a full professor is the highest academic rank that one can achieve. And I'm sure it's a very proud moment for you all, for you, Prof, for your mom, sitting over there, she gave me a royal wave, <laughs> uh, your colleagues and your community, as much as it is for us, your colleagues at Nelson Mandela University. We congratulate you most heartily on achieving this accolade and recognition in the academy. The vision of the university is to be a dynamic African university, recognized for its leadership in generating cutting edge knowledge for a sustainable future. Having just heard this inaugural lecture on this very important topic, 
there can be no doubt that Prof Ngobo Sitoli is doing cutting edge work in this arena. There is probably no greater imperative in this country and the world at large to try to understand and get to the bottom of the scourge of gender-based violence. It is linked, <clears throat> as she has said, to very particular histories in this country, as well as to a global culture of patriarchy. The work of Prof. Tolley provides insights into some of these links, as well as possible ways to address these. Professor, on reading your abstract for this lecture and listening to the details of the research and analysis you have shared with us this evening, you have left us with much to think about. And also, personally, you said we must put on the therapeutic mask, but I think much to cry about. As you have indicated, South Africa has made some strides in recognizing women's rights in this country, and you've read from some of those laws from the Constitution that show this. But you also highlight the fact that women in the rural areas have not benefited from most of the developments. They are still exposed to cultural practices that are dehumanizing, and you've explored how these practices are linked to gender-based violence. In your lecture, you make reference to well-articulated policy frameworks and laws aimed at the protection of women. But still, the sad fact remains that gender-based violence continues to be an everyday occurrence in this country. The stats remain very high, and all too often, this violence leads to death. The interesting contribution you have made tonight is to highlight that gender-based violence has been understood from a Western perspective with limited attention to what you have called the traditional perspective. You put forward the suggestions that perhaps the controversies in the legal and policy framework are a reflection of the application of a Western perspective and limited, therefore, perspective on cultural African beliefs. In this lecture, you have presented these contrasting views in the legal framework and have tried to advance an understanding of African customs as they may link to gender-based violence. This inaugural lecture is timely, indeed, not just in terms of the scourge of gender-based violence, but also in view of the drive towards an Afrocentric psychology. You have shown that while available literature and thus research has focused quite extensively on cultural aspects related to mental illness and therapy, there has been a limited focus on cultural aspects linked to gender-based violence. So it has been enlightening to hear about possible interventions based on what you contribute that take cognizance of the dynamic nature of cultural and pervasive nature, I would say, of cultural beliefs and practices. Your voice rings out clearly, <coughs> gently, but clearly, in your advocacy around adherence to cultural practices which are not discriminating against women. We need to stand firm against the often invoked myth or saying that patriarchal practices and prejudices are part of an African culture. This is what you're asking us to stand up to and against. And we need to examine and explore these ideas much more deeply to look at how Ubuntu fits into this picture. At Nelson Mandela University, we are committed to the values of Ubuntu, social justice, and equality. Your work advances these values and addresses a terrible reality in our society. Your work reinforces the imperative to collectively take a stand, to find ways to stop it happening. Our university is extremely proud of you and your work, and that you're an alumnus, which helps us to map out new ways of acting and taking responsibility. Thank you, Prof. Ngobo Sitole, for sharing your work with us here this evening, and congratulations again. I also want to say thanks to a family, to a mum. I don't think I've ever heard somebody express it so beautifully. You carried her not just for nine months. To her sisters, her daughters, 
uh, friends and family who come from as far as the Western Cape and KwaZulu-Natal, we really appreciate your presence here tonight. You have honored us to be part of this occasion. Thank you very much. I'd now like to call up the alumni officer to hand over a token of her new stature, Professor Tolley, your new stature, within the university convocation. Thank you, Prof. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Prof, after this privilege of sitting here and listening to your lecture, I couldn't stop thinking, perhaps my future husband should come here and sit around this panel for my Lobola negotiations. <laughs> That's a perhaps safer, you know. Um, Prof, this comes from the alumni office. It's a token of appreciation for you carrying us through as the Nelson Mandela University. We say to you, Bogoto Teina, as the mother of a nation, please continue what you are doing. Our own, very own, Dr. Nelson Mandela says, freedom cannot be achieved unless the women have been emancipated from all of their oppressions. Thank you, Prof. Wenzekash. So, colleagues, friends, family, finally, on behalf of the Nelson Mandela University, I would like to thank you all for your attendance at this important event in the almanac of the university. A special thanks to those in the administrative offices and divisions who have been involved with the arrangements for this important event to ensure that it's all gone smoothly. You have been a wonderful and attentive audience, and we are grateful that you have honored us with your presence here tonight. We now invite you, once the procession has left the hall, to please join us for some light refreshments in the foyer. Thank you very much. Thank you.